Welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio, and today I'm joined by one of our RNT clients, Dan Hill. Dan's a serial entrepreneur in the world of property, and over the past year has completely transformed his body to get into the shape of his life. In this episode, we talk about the journey Dan's gone through so far and how an extended phase of cleaning the palette served him so well in achieving his photo shoot condition, as well as his experiences in consolidation so far. Where this podcast gets really interesting though is when we discuss the arts and characteristics of high performance, the mindset required for it, and the introspection and insights you gain going through dark periods of a transformation. This is a candid and raw episode where we both go deep into why we do what we do, common struggles of high performers, and why ultimately, as Dan likes to say, success and failure are both very predictable. How was the party then? Yeah, it was good. It was good to celebrate 10 years. It was, it was mad, like, reflecting on it. We had lots of old people, like, lots of the old school team came. Um, the the team organised the whole party so there's loads of like little surprises and they, they got they put a slideshow up yeah of the last 10 years and that was very high impact but yeah it was good it was nice good in my reflection then yeah it was good because like 10 years is a milestone and they got me the most amazing scrapbooks they made me a scrapbook with like photos and messages from everyone for like the last 10 years and uh it's good because like 10 years is that's 10 years done and you know we've traveled quite a distance in that period it's definitely like a milestone as to what's next and i think through this process as well through this like through the cut really i've had a lot of like introspective thoughts and things like that so it's really it's like perfectly timed to look at where you've got to and have the privilege of having a scrapbook with everyone's you know everyone's sharing their sentiments about the business about me you know, about the journey and things like that. And I'm not getting it having died or retired. Do you know what I mean? I'm getting it as a, as a milestone and it's really, it's really good food for thought. So it's, it was, yeah, it was nice. It was really, really good. Good. And it came at a good time just after the end of your photo shoot. Perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. And how are you feeling since then? It's been, we're recording this about maybe 10 days, nearly two weeks after now. How are you feeling uh, f- since we since we saw each other that day, um, definitely. F- like I've got the new set of rules now, so you know the new set of rules is basically eighty twenty. Stick to the macro, like work work with the macros. So what I've done is I've just gone back to basics. I'm using my s- standard meal prep, but then I'm starting to mix things up. So for example, today, like normally I'd have chicken broccoli and rice for lunch, and chicken broccoli and rice for dinner. But tonight, but today I'm having chicken, broccoli, rice, salad for lunch. And then I'm having like homemade burgers and salad and rice this evening. So I'm starting to introduce things gradually. So that's good. And I've, I've definitely had my first experience at the weekend of, you know, when you're saying at the end of a cut, you have no like hunger mechanism. Like you, you, your brain doesn't know when you're full. You have to wait till you physically implode basically. So because, because obviously I've been on my diet, my cut and everything, uh, the team organised like, like a huge barbecue and then a giant sa- salad bar as well. So there's like salad, green beans, red onion, gherkins, jalapenos, like uh, rice salad. So I piled it up with salad and then had like some nice meat on top as well and over eight in volume. And uh, uh, literally half an hour later, 45 minutes later, I couldn't even drink. Like, I was like, my stomach was like just in absolute agony from uh, overeating because it's the first time I've done it in like three months. So in the bottom there's pit once you've uh, once you've come out of a cut and you don't really know when you're full. No, it's cr- and it's and it hurts, doesn't it? So you have to you have to feel it, and then and then now you'll probably know. Uh, the next time you're in that sort of environment, you'll be a, in a much more equipped uh, to to avoid that situation again. Well, yeah, so it's these new things of like, you learn better from your mistakes, don't you? When you don't know what's the other side of the line, you learn. So I've had two experiences now. One was when I just had a binge. So I had a, I think it was like the, the week after my photo shoot, I went out, all you can eat meal, not all you can eat meal, but I went out and I had yo sushi. I had a couple of drinks. I went for a, a nice dessert, a dessert place. 
and it was the first time I've gone like way through my macros. And then I woke up the next day with, you know, depression, guilt, anxiety, feeling like in, I could feel the inflammation from the things that I'd eaten off plan. So that was my first sort of like, right, I don't want to feel like that. So there's a reason not to step off. And then Saturday, just overeating, it was, you know, it was an excuse to eat loads. So I did it. Uh, and I went in intentionally went to do it. because I was like, yeah, I'm going to eat loads. And it was crippling, like so painful. So now it's like, well, there's no point in doing that because the downside is, is too, too, you know, the, the penalty is too high. Yeah, and you put yourself through so much to get there. You don't want to reverse all your hard work straight away. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been quite, I've, I don't know whether I've been quite fortunate or I've been quite good on that. I mean, up, like yesterday, the day before, I'm still at shoot weight. Like, I'm literally like 0.1 kilograms over shoot weight, which is mad. But I think that's basically, I've, I've played the same game. You know, if I do have a day when I overeat, and by overeat, I mean, if I have 100 grams too much carbs, I'll claw it back the next day. So I'm still playing that game. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be more flexible with the food, but still keep with the macros. So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I think I said to you on the day, I think you're going to learn a lot, a lot about yourself in the next few weeks, what you actually like, what you dislike, what feels good, what doesn't feel good. So as you experiment with more foods, with more macros, you'll, you'll, you'll start to feel, you start to know what foods agree with you and uh, which tricks to use in the day that really work for you. Yeah, and I've got, I mean, we've not had our check-in this week, and I'm still only like one week out of the cup, really. And uh, we've we only had, you know, we only had our check-in last week or whatever, and quite a lot's happened since then. One question, which, you you know, you cannot come back to me on my check-in, is things like, I can eat things in my macros, which I like, but then, is that a good thing or not? So, for example, granola. Yeah. Like, granola's really tasty. With, like, granola, I planned out my macros today. This morning, I was going to have uh, 60 grams of granola, half a pot of like zero fat yogurt, which is like got, got my proteins in and then a handful of seeds on top and go, like goji berries or whatever they're called. Cause I really like eating that. And I used to eat it quite a lot. as like a treat and it fits in my macros, but then I bailed at the last minute and was like, actually there's loads of sugar in there. Like and I've got a feeling if I eat that the whole rest of the day, I'll be like hooked on sugar. So that's one question is like, if it, even if it's in your macros, is there still things you shouldn't eat like that? I mean, granola is fine. The only, the only thing you want to be careful of is granola doesn't give you much volume. So with the macros you're currently on, I mean, just finished a cut, you're probably not going to get much bang for your buck having granola. So you can absolutely have it if you can have just the amount that you've given yourself. If you're fine with that, then it's absolutely fine and, and you can roll with it. But I've just found that granola is quite a low volume food. Uh, so you might not get as much as you, you think you're getting, uh, as opposed to say oats, where you're going to get a lot more uh, in terms of volume where yeah. at this point of the, of the phase you're in you want volume to keep yourself full um, so it's absolutely n- nothing wrong with having granola just want to be careful of, of that perspective yeah oh I'll bear that in mind maybe I'll try it then I just bailed because it, it's got quite a lot of sugar in I know what I'm like with sugar like sugar is so addictive I'm, I'm like I'm, you know what I mean it's like you have one sweet you can't have one sweet you end up eating the whole lot and then emptying the cupboards you know what I mean so yeah, so you've got to be careful of your trigger foods. Exactly. So yeah, everything sound. I'm definitely refed now, which is like the whole issues I've had through the process with anxiety, like mind games, depression, like all of those mental things that I experienced, especially when the cut got really aggressive, coming out of the car, still having that lot. And uh, I've definitely refed myself now and I'm getting these, my carb intake up. And I can notice it. Like I'm, I'm an hour away from eating now. And I was just going went out for a walk a minute ago and I could, I could feel my sort of irritability levels starting to come back up because I'm still in quite a reasonable deficit. Yeah. But I could start to feel them. I'm like, right, it's obviously now nearly time to eat. But my body in the main, I feel like a different man, honestly. I feel like back to my normal self. And I haven't felt like that for like three months. Yeah, you look like a different man as well. <laughs> in a good way or bad way? In a good way. You're smiling. Uh, you've got some energy again. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, it, go, go, go. And it's mad, like, now I'm out of it. I went back into the office Monday after my shoot or whenever it was, and I had the weekend, a bit of a refeed, you know, my, my macros had gone back up, I was well fed. And like, everyone was just like bouncing, like everyone was bouncing off the energy and, and people were like, oh my God, like you in such a good mood. And it was like being drunk for three months. Maybe not three months, 
but the, definitely the last six to eight weeks being drunk and because it happens gradually you don't really notice how low you go with it and then you come out the other end and it's like sobering up it's like when you've got a really dirty hangover and you go to bed and you wake up the next day and you're fresh and you're like or, or when you're ill and you feel horrendous and then you, all of a sudden you're well again and you like feel so grateful for being normal like i just feel i just feel normal so i feel very yeah it's, it was a, it was a very very educational process Good. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak to you so quickly after the shoot about this is because you had a lot of insights uh, in that in those final six weeks uh, where you really, you know, you really dug in to get into into very good condition. But the mind games were what was really interesting, and it really tested your mental fortitude here. Do you want to dig in? I know it's a very deep question to to start with, but do you want to dig into some of the mind games you were feeling? and how you ultimately dealt with the last three to four weeks where things were getting really tough. Yeah, so one thing I didn't... One thing, I went into the process... I mean, I think one of the good things was I took a run-up. I took that six-month run-up because I didn't have the motivation, I didn't have the drive, but I had the appetite to learn more and master my body, that sort of thing. So I I started to learn the, the hacks and the tricks and put the blueprint together and start to make the game so it was easy to play. And when I went into it, the biggest thing I was concerned about was the hunger and the discipline. But actually, because I just followed the, you know, followed the normal process of create the rules, make it a game, break it all down, just like we do with lots of things going into it. The the challenge I didn't have was the discipline. Like I really had that. I found that quite comfortable. What to eat, when to eat. I just took any decisions off the table and then locked in and that was sound. But then the danger the danger came where I played it too safe. So the first one, which was probably about eight or eight weeks away from the car, 10 weeks away from the car, uh, 10 weeks away from the shoot when I was in the car and I went away for the weekend. Do you remember? And you said, play it safe. Like, cause I, when, when I've got my macros, the danger is I actually end up under eating, which then is bad because I'm already in a huge deficit. And you said, cause it's an all inclusive restaurant that I was at or an all inclusive resort. I was at for three days just cut out all the carbs because you'll probably end up picking up the fats and stuff like that in the cooking. And it just so happened the place I went was ridiculously clean. So I didn't end up having the carbs and I didn't end up overeating on the fats. And I went and played like 18 holes of golf and I walked 30,000 steps and it was 22 degrees or whatever. And I literally like, that was my first experience of it going really, really bad. Like the whole day I had mind games, negative thoughts, anxiety, and it got to the evening. I remember we went to the block. Like, they've got a bowling alley there. And all I could hear was these loud voices. I was just like, because I'm quite a suppressed person anyway, I'm not the one to sort of start venting out. But I'm, I'm not the sort, I, I never thought I'd be capable of a nervous breakdown. But it put me in environments like that where I've been like, oh my God, like I literally can't handle this. And uh, just had to grind, my, grind myself through it. So it's like the voice on your shoulder, the voice in your head, the negative thoughts. And then again, when you sober up from them, the next morning, I was like, I'm not having that again today. I'm having some porridge, even though I was not supposed to have any carbs. So I had some porridge. Oh, no, no, it wasn't porridge, actually. I had two new potatoes, two new potatoes. And within 35 minutes, I felt sober again. And I was like, oh, my God, like these things are all made up. They're in my head. And it's just, it's, it's the strangest experience. Yeah. The, the, the voices on your head is something I can relate to when you're dieting really, really hard. Um, what... What were you doing? Because ultimately you had to stay in a deficit. What were you doing? What were you telling yourself to uh, push through this? Because everyone reacts differently to a deficit. Yours was very much mental mind games. Besides eating new potatoes, which, you know, in, in, in that case, it probably was worth it and, and it was needed because you were back onto meal plan. But in a normal circumstance, what were you doing? Um, just grinding it out. Like, it doesn't matter how... And I, I've never had, like I'll quite honestly say, I've never had a huge level of understanding and even empathy for people who have issues with anxiety and stuff like that. And, and if I'm honest, people who've got issues with anxiety, previously I've looked at and thought, how bad can it be? Do you know what I mean? Like, what is it? You're feeling a bit low? You're feeling a bit upset? Now that I've actually experienced it at, at that length, it is a very real thing. It's like, it's these voices in your head. And I'm, I'm a very logical person. I know that they don't make sense. But there's been times I've been driving around in my car thinking, 
I'm going to sell the businesses. You know, I've had, I can't, I've had enough of this. This isn't fun anymore. Like really, really dark mind games. And there was three times when I refed to get out of it. Like twice you told me to refeed and once I refed myself. So that was one way to get out of it. The rest of the time, I just, in the main, probably 80% of the time, I just gr- ground through it. And then the other times, it was just really managing my, my meals, like making sure I ate absolutely bang on and just try and go, grind through it, really. Um, but it was it was dark. Like I'd say, and with, with this cut as well, I went into it. I'm all about challenges. I've done loads of challenges, and I'm all about pushing myself. And... Um, and I went into it wanting it to be hard. You know, I wanted it to be hard. I wanted it to be painful, you know, slightly masochistically. That was why I signed up for it. I was like, have I got the physical and mental ability to take my body down to this level? But because it happens so gradually, you don't realize how deep you go with it. Um, and I don't, honestly don't know whether I'd recommend it to anyone. The biggest thing I'd say is everything irritated me. Like, if I put my earphone in and, and it fell out, it would irritate me. Or like my phone clicks, it would irritate me. So it was like, yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a more mentally challenging experience than anything else. I, I thought the hunger was fine. I thought the training was fine. Just the mind games was, was horrendous. And I've never had, I've never been a stressed person. I've never had anxiety issues. I've dealt with some really difficult things, you know, running marathon, running a business, doing loads of stuff like that before. But I've never felt, as I've never felt mentally as challenged as I did with the car. Yeah, so you had so you had six months build up to uh, create your habits, system, structure, etc. Then you decided to do this uh, photo shoot to really push yourself and see how far you can go in with condition. With the symptoms you were just you just explained, anyone listening to that would think, why 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 on earth did he want to carry on? Like what what was pushing you to keep going when some of the stuff you said would throw most people off? Uh, besides being masochistic what's going on there why why would you why did you do this um well i signed up for the challenge and it, i mean both i knew uh, why did it well it, failure is just not an option it's like like failure is 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 just absolutely not an option and i sort of quite enjoy it i sort of quite enjoyed it although it was so challenging it was like the whole thing is, do you have it in you as an individual? One of my mentors uh, talks about crossing the desert. And this is the process of taking a small startup business into a big performance corporate business. And he says that journey is like, you should recommend it to no one. Most people's businesses collapse when they do it. It's the most dangerous process you can go through as an entrepreneur. But if I say to you, your head will actually physically fall off when you go through this process, it will make you want to do it more than not. And they're the sort of people who should sign up to these sort of challenges. And that's that. It's like, it was something I wanted to do. I wanted to prove whether I had it. And it was just failure is not an option. Like, I wrote 14 weeks on the mirror, wrote my shoot date, wrote my start date and my starting weight. And then every week it was just like, I'll do what's required to hit the target. I don't think many people enjoy running marathons, but, you know, when you cross the line, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's all about the journey, not the, not the end result. Now, I mean, now you look great and you feel great, but <laughs> you put yourself through hell to get there. Definitely, yeah, and it, and it has an end point. I wouldn't do it. I don't know if I'd do it again. I ran along the marathon. I don't know if I'd do that again. Yeah. Um, I think I'll definitely maintain and carry on the benefits of it. But you know, it's it's not. Um, th- there's lots of negative. Oh, yeah. uh, there's lots of side effects from go- doing that. Going to that extreme. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's very much to go to that level of extreme is is all about the challenge and it's all about you've got to just say to yourself. I just want to see what I can do. And, and, and very much like yourself, I, I'm three weeks away from my shoe and I'm thinking, oh, it's finally getting hard now. Now is when it really counts. Now, it, now I want to feel the suffering. You know, I, want, I want to feel that hunger. I want to feel the, the heavy legs and all of that. Yeah, yeah. and, it's, and it, yeah, it's that. It's, it is. It's exactly that. And the other thing as well is I want to do it the best. That's, when you say like, what, what makes you carry on, like it, in my head, it wasn't just carrying on. It was, I want to do this the best that is possible. I only intend on doing it once. And every time I'm lifting those weights or I'm considering putting something in my mouth, I'm like, I'm going to do this once in my lifetime. And on that shoot day, I want to be in the best, you know, I want to have lifted every single rep that I could. I want to have, have 
eaten as close to plan, you know, as, as meticulously as possible. And I want those photos to be the absolute best they can be. And I compare, you know, and I compare myself to other people, you know, I asked you to send me photos of other people who've done it, who are my sort of body type. And I sort of got those up and sort of saved them on my laptop. And I was like, right, well, I can see where they could have done better. I think that that could, that part of the body could be better, well developed. And I took all of the bits that they'd done well. And I took all the bits that I thought they could have done better. And then I carved out what I thought was the best potential outcome for myself. And then every decision is based on, you know, I want to lift that check. I want to cross that line. I want to, I want my shoe to look like that. And I said to you, I want my shoe to look like a bodybuilder. I don't want to look like a weedy, skinny person who's done a, a cut. I want to look like a bodybuilder. And that, and that pushed me all the way through because, you know, you're simultaneously trying to cut fat and grow muscle. And that is, that is hard. Yeah. Looking back, what, what benefits um, do you feel you've get? What insights do you think you've gained from the, the experience? Now you're in a better position to talk about it. Um, well, the biggest, one of, one of my personal objectives this year for me personally was to master my body. So I've always trained, I've always dieted, all of that. But it wasn't until I started the six months sort of my own sort of six month warm up and started to learn. Uh, you, you don't know what you don't know. You know, I'd be the guy that would quite happily eat four, four whole eggs, a whole packet of smoked salmon and half an avocado for breakfast and put a photo on Instagram and be like, you know, this is a healthy meal. And then when you start to understand what macros are, you're like, oh, you just look like a fool because, yeah, I just, so the biggest, I don't know about insight, the biggest education I got is about food, yeah. is understanding how it works. So that, that is without a doubt one of the most valuable things I've learned. Uh, new habits, you know, getting your steps in, walking to work rather than driving, getting your water levels up. One thing I, th I think as well is, um, the six month run up, what I did on that was I created loads of hacks to make it easy. So it's things like, um, eating at set times. So I still eat at 11, three and six. So eat at set times, um, drinking soda water, chewing, chewing gum, eating jalapenos, uh, bulking my meals out with rocket, which seems to fill me out really well. Finding loads of little hacks to go into it, to trick yourself and trick your body, those sort of things. Um, I definitely had an, in, without keep going back to the sort of mental wellness element of that, like in that introspective period, it made me question a lot of my life. So it made me question a lot of the business, how I spend my life. Am I doing the right thing? You know, what's life all about? Why do we sign up for these things? Have, have I wasted the last 10 years building a business while all my friends have been going out and starting families? You know, all of those things. And it, I've played all of those thoughts out so long during the cut. Now that I've sobered up, I've just ended up with a boiled down version of like really nice sort of things to consider. And um, so being introspective and stopping for breath has, has been What's good. What's the outcome of those uh, thoughts in the end now that you've sobered up? Um, well, I'm still definitely coming through the process. And I think a good thing was my 10 year pop company party at the weekend it's just a really nice milestone and in my speech at the party i said you know we reflected the 10 years i took everyone through the journey in my speech and then i said like if we ask if, if we were to look at like what's what do the next 10 years look like but i honestly couldn't tell you um we we're at a fantastic point as a company you know we've achieved everything we set out to we've achieved a lifetime's worth of work in a decade which puts us in a really fortunate position and the next thing is I'm going to, you know, I'm taking December off. I'm going to go traveling. I'm not even a big traveler, but I'm going, going to travel in. I've been invited out with Get Up and Give Back, the charity that we run to go out to uh, Ghana to see some operations be carried out. I'm just going to go and, and have some time to think about things and, uh, and just, just regroup, really. Just not go all guns black. I've previously been all guns blazing for the last 10 years. I'm definitely going to explore a change of pace and see what that looks like have you uh, have you dis discussed within yourself the whole uh, whether the 10 years have been worth it or not um that's a big that's a big question to ask yourself the scrapbook that i've been given is honestly the most amazing thing because you and i've had a conversation previously like when you have those early success wins as an entrepreneur where you've got the band of brothers, you're all friends, you're loving it, 
you've got your first clients who think you're amazing, those compliments land well and you think this is great. And then you get carried away on this success train and, and the, the, the success triggers have a bit of a law of diminishing return. You have to go bigger and harder to, to achieve things because your brain needs to be pushed. You take on bigger challenges, but also the reward mechanism becomes less, especially if you're not financially motivated. Yeah. You know, you go and do these grand things and you start to become either numb or less immediately receptive to the success triggers, like the compliments, the awards, things like that. So there's definitely a law of diminishing returns in that capacity. So you have to look a bit further afield to where to get those. When I got this scrapbook, people in there have written like the most, like the loveliest messages about the value I've added to their lives, the journeys we've been on, the things they remember. And that, that, that's great. The last 10 years, I would do it. I would do the last 10 years twice to get that scrapbook. It's like, this is your life. And I, it's like reading it. And one of the things I said to someone this morning was I'm so grateful and proud and fortunate that I'm not reading this on my deathbed or like I'm not retired. And then I'm reading it. I'm reading it now. And it's making me stop for breath and appreciate where I am because, you know, it's, when you're on the bullet train, it's easy, easy not to look out the window you is it all about self-mastery and personal development it's definitely about growth it's about i like the challenge this week my whole thing this week because i want to get my body back to normal i want to get my relationships back to normal the whole thing this week is about no stress so it's chilled out it's relaxed not taking on any new work the other thing as well is when i was doing this cut you gotta think some of the things we were doing commercially were like the biggest things we've ever done then we bought three businesses. We moved head office, head offices. We broke a world record. Uh, we launched. Uh, we we we've doubled the size of our training business. The, the stress that came with that is simultaneous to being in like up to a two thousand calorie deficit for a period of time. Was was absolutely uh, absolutely ridiculous. So I'm having to chill out now, but I like being in that. I like being under pressure, but it's got to be the right amount of, amount of pressure. So I do enjoy that, but I need to stop for breath and make sure that I need to choose my battles wisely moving forward because the challenge, challenge is good, but I need to make sure that it has a tangible outcome that I, I value, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and what would that tangible outcome be? Well, the closest, I mean, I've had, and this has all come out through the cut, like the last three months of looking at it, timing wise, things like that. If I look at, at the minute, it's monetary. So I do go through all this challenge, all this pain to pull something off. I pull it off and then at the end is some money and it's a thankless task because money, money is everything and money is nothing in equal measure. You know, money to me now is a resource and it's not hugely, it's a huge anticlimax when that is the result. The closest I can see is uh, Elon Musk. Like, I resonate with Elon Musk a lot. He's got this like ridiculous work ethic. He's got this drive to challenge himself. He wants to go and achieve these phenomenal things. And at the end, and, which, and when he talks about it, the way that it, it's on his mind all the time, it's in his heart all the time, he's restless, he, he needs this, he needs to be constantly stimulated, like mentally and physically. I definitely resonate with that. And like the whole thing he talks about, I'm like, that's me. But then I look at what he's doing and at the end of it, he has, he's changing the world with electric cars. You know, he's looking at taking what life to become multi-planetary species and go over to Mars. And I think at the end of mine, I don't have that got pot of gold at the end. Of, or, or the thing is I have a pot of gold at the end of the at rain at the end of the cha challenge, but I don't want that. Whereas he's doing things which actually are more tangible and more likable. And I think from the interview I did with Adam, the biggest thing that came out of that was, I think, like the, the, the things that make my eyes war and make me feel emotional and make me feel rewarded is when I do something for other people, like get up and give back. And I think, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if my, the next part of my journey goes into more of a like social, charitable sort of space. I'm sort of playing with that at the minute. Philanthropic, yeah. Um, essentially having a bigger picture. So for you, you it's, it's very much money. Property isn't giving... It's, it's not changing lives per se. It's just purely for business. Yeah, it's commercial, and it's given me like a really. It's given me my experience, and I've earned my stripes, and it's given me this ability to achieve things. Now that it gives me, you know, now that it provides for me financially, 
I need to find something that provides for me sort of emotionally. I've definitely become more emotional person through this cut. Like without a doubt, but like, I've had always had as an entrepreneur, you have to become quite bulletproof and I've definitely suppressed emotions. I, I, like people credit me a lot for being like, I don't know what you call it. But nothing shakes me really. Like I'm just very sort of balanced, like very, the, someone can say the worst thing in the world's happened and I'm at a stage now where it doesn't phase me. But during this car, I've definitely got more in tune with my emotions again, which has been quite nice. And it's made me realize a lot about some of my personal relationships. So I'm focused a lot now on investing into those and, you know, really, really nurturing them. So even at the beginning of this, uh, of this chat, you, you were talking a lot about the, 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 the negatives that you associate, but now what's coming out is the amount of introspection you gain from this car. How it's actually opened up a lot of different sort of boxes in your life that were perhaps not fulfilled previously. And then now you're more aware of them and you want to explore them a bit more. Definitely. It made me stop for breath. Yeah, it's, it's all about, it's, it's been hugely introspective. It's been, it's, it's, yeah, it has been introspective. It's made me question everything. And also, go, it's pulled back my emotional side, which is good because I've not experienced that for probably five, six years as I've been like a absolutely relentless entrepreneur, like fast growth entrepreneur. It's pulled that back. But it's also brought back a level of gratitude. Like I can't emphasize enough this thing about being drunk and sober. Like the cut happened so gradually. I went down and down and down. And then when I came out of it, like, like the week after the shoot, even just the weekend after the shoot, when I was refed, the pressure was off, the stress was off. I had a couple of business projects that finished at exactly the same time, a couple of like development sites that sold. It all came together in the space of about a week. And I literally, like the Monday, went into the office and, and I was like a new person. I was my old self. I was smiling. I was positive, loving life. And I was literally, I was literally like skipping to work, listening to music, just thinking like, I'm not even exaggerating now. I was literally like, I was like, oh my God, I feel like I've had a, a terminal illness or mental illness and I've just been relieved of it. And I just, I, I just felt so grateful that I had that clear headspace. And, and now I'm taking all those learnings and adding them to my life moving forward. Where do you think the, the relentlessness comes from? I think one of the dangers of fast growth and high, high, fast growth entrepreneurs and high performers is it's all or nothing like it's all or nothing if you're going to do something you do it the best it can be and i obsessed over that cut like to an unhealthy level like i would weigh out the food to not not just to point one of a gram so if it went over point one of a gram i would take it that i would take the food off with my little finger like the oats or uh if i was weighing out like dry goods, I can't even, oh, like protein powders and things like that. Like I wouldn't even trust the scoop. Like I'd weigh, I'd weigh things out to the to the absolute nth degree, and and make sure that it was done. So like, yeah, it's just all or nothing. Failure is not an option, but like absolutely not an option. And I'm doing this once. I'm going to do it the best I can do it. I could, I, I knew what that photo would look like before I even started the cut. Like 14 weeks in. I knew in my head what I wanted to look like. And you, I remember saying to you halfway through, I was like, I don't want to go into this looking like, a, like a, I've done a cut and, it, and the impressive thing being the low body fat. I want to look like a bodybuilder. And I, I, I remember your sentiments about halfway through being basically like, well, we need to see how much like muscle mass you've got and things like that. And it was, I think you were managing my expectations that it's unlikely to achieve that in the first shoot because we're simultaneously cutting fat and you, you, you're trying to maintain mass, muscle mass, not build it. And uh, in my head, I was like, well, no, that is, that is where I'm going. Like, I know where I'm going with this. And then, when, and then when we got the shots we got and I did look pumped and I had the muscle and I had the low fat, I was like, yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah. But where does, uh, where does that come from? Where, where does the relentlessness come from? You mentioned that failure is not an option, but you've done this in your cut you've done this in business where do you think it all comes from well i got an email from my granddad who was not lots of my family in fact one of the one of the different one of the more most difficult things i think i, I talked about this in my 10 week in my 10 year speech i said one of the things I'm, I'm most grateful for 
is in 10 years, despite me, you know, despite me ha- ha- taking huge financial risks, having loads of business pressure, personal pressure, I had glandular fever, I didn't even realise and ended up with short-term memory loss. My hair fell out at one point. I was like, even though I pushed myself to like the hardest level it's physically possible, none of my friends or family anywhere through the process ever told me to stop. And I think one of the things, and, my, one, and then my granddad emailed me during the cut, during this process, like no, none of my friends or family ever told me to stop, but they weren't complimentary of the process. You know, you, you would have experienced it. Your clients will experience it. People are like, you're losing too much weight. You know, your clothes are hanging off you. And when you go flat, you do look unhealthy. Like, you, you know, I was looking at it thinking, I think I said to you once, is this actually healthy? I can see what, where people, I can see where people's concern comes from. My granddad emailed to me and said, you need to stop doing these things. Like, you're going to kill yourself. You've got, you, you, I think you've got uh, mental health issues. Um, like, you need to stop feeling like you need to prove yourself. And I did think that. And I thought, I thought that the first point is I'm just going to sort of take on board and just brush off because, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. I think I'm doing it under good supervision. And, you know, I think I feel happy with what I'm doing. But, um, I think he has a valid point about not trying, I don't have to keep trying to prove myself. And I think it is proving myself. I don't know if it's to others or to myself, but when, when I wrote those 14 weeks on the mirror, it was like, I need to see if I can do this. I need to see if I can get across the line. I need to see if I can get, you know, lift the trophy. And I, I don't know whether I was proving it to myself or proving it to other people. But, but I, yeah, I think, there's definitely a degree of am I actually capable of this? And in my head thinking, yeah, I am. Like, there's no way that I'm not doing it. Does that, answer, does that even get anywhere close? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand where you're going for and I can relate to that. It, it, what, what gets you through it? What, what do you think makes you, you know, you, you've, this is the first time you've done it. What, what, what goes through your head? Where does your drive and what, what makes you actually do it? Do what the, the the cutting and all of that. Yeah, get show ready. Like get ready for a shoot. It's uh, I, I think a lot of it is is proving to myself that I can do it. It's it's trying to be better than last time. It's can I get better? Uh, am I am I still sharp enough to do it? Have I lost my edge? Uh, can I prove it to Can I prove it to my clients and show them I can still do it? A lot of it is very much like that. Um, comes from insecurities as a as a teenager with with why I started to train, which was all about you know I had I had moves in a pot belly, so in my head I'm trying to you know I'm trying to get out of that. Um, and for me, when I'm not when I'm not super lean, I do end up drifting towards that, but a bigger version of it, which is why yeah. I don't feel unconfident about it now. But it all comes back from those earlier memories. Um, and it's very similar in business as well. It's like, you know, I had all the haters at the beginning, uh, and the doubters, and it's always like trying to prove, I, I'm still trying to figure out again, is, is that I'm approving to myself or other people? And it's probably a combination. It's probably still is a combination there. Um, but a lot of it is very much like, how, much, how far can I take it? How much more can I push myself? How deep can I go into this without crossing the red line? Um, sometimes I do cross the red line then I know it, but uh, how, how, how much, how much more extreme can I go? And what will I experience when I'm there? It's, it's like self-discovery, self-improvement, but also a bit of sort of proving the critics wrong as well. I think one thing that I recommend to everyone, and I don't know if, I think you probably saw, I did a Facebook live, but it's on YouTube and I talk about the iceberg and like the how to actually you know if you want to break world records and get down to single level body fat and you know do these phenomenal things i do think a lot of it is it's not so much well there's loads of things to it but it's who is prepared to put themselves through the most pain in a lot of examples and the only way you can do that is to raise the stakes and you talked about with regards to the whole proving thing whilst i've not consciously acknowledge that I know that's one thing I need to consider is like, am I, why am I doing it? Am I trying to prove it? Part of the process is to raise the stakes. And when you decide you're going to do it is shout it from the rooftops, plaster it all over, you know, the headlines, 
So then you have to prove to other people you do it because that's part. That's definitely part of the drive deliberately for me. You know, when, it, when yeah. I think there's another thing to be said for the level of self-confidence it gives you when you set such a high stake uh, and then you go out and you do it and everything you do in the process of getting there, where whether it's you know me- measuring your 0.1 grams, no one's going to know if you did two grams plus, two grams below, but you'll know. And I think it builds that self-esteem and self-confidence in you. And every time you do something like this, you just feel more bulletproof. You feel like you can do even bigger things uh, and I think it just carries over and transcends each time. Yeah, definitely. There's got like two. I think there's two two valuable things there. Um, so, so one is confidence, and the other one is cheating. So, confidence, like confidence, comes from like Latin. If you look at where it actually comes from, it is it is confidence, confidant. There's lots of different variations of it. it all comes it, it, when you boil it down. It, it comes from trust. It means trust, and it's basically trust true confidence which is and that was one of the other things I put in my speech that what I've achieved in the last 10 years it was one line is true confidence mm. I'm so confident in myself now I'll be interviewed on you know national media or whatever in my scruffy t-shirt and things like that because I'm so confident in who I am now I don't have to wear the flashy shirts and drive flashy cars because I'm confident in myself and the reason that is is I trust myself that I have the ability to do things and I feel proud of who I am. And I, I, I judge myself favorably because I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm a man of my word. I don't say I'm going to do something and then not do it. I don't say, yeah, I'm going to go on this diet and then start eating fish and chips. You know, it's like confidence is definitely that. Like it definitely gives you confidence. Um, and then when it's done as well, yeah, when it's done, Shiv sent me a message and like, he sent me a vo- really nice voice message, just checking in on me, seeing how I felt. And I, and I sent him a voice message back. And he said, like, just listening to your message, he said, I'd like to have a chat with you because it sounds like you're not hugely, like, chuffed with the outcome or, like, you, you don't feel, like, elated and celebrated that it's done. It, he said, it sounds like it's just another box ticked. And I was like, it, it is. Like, it is. I didn't, I didn't drive out from that photo shoot thinking, amazing, it's job done, look at this, look at this body. I was like, right, well, it's job done now, what's next? It was just a tick of a box. So, uh, I talked about this on a, on a solo podcast I recorded last week. And I talked about how anytime I, I achieve something, it's just what's next. Like, like it's just more, 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 but it's never materialistic. It's just like, well, what's next? Like, what's next? All right, you've done this. Well, what can you do next? Like, what, what, can you, what can you take from what you've just done and, and, and do next? So for you, it could be the fact, okay, now I've done this. Now, how can I socially impact people in a better way? Or how can I uh, improve my relationships now? What, what's, uh, the next, what's the next box of tick for you? Well, this is the choosing your battles wisely is like, make sure you know the iceberg, you know, you look at the tip of the iceberg, which is the challenge, but make sure you look at what's involved and, you know, make sure it's something you want to want to sign up for. The other thing with high performers, which is very dangerous. And this is where I think I'm guilty of, um, is you get on this success train where you just become addicted to the adrenaline and the pain and the suffering of chasing this elusive there and because it is an anti-climax, you're like, oh, I need the next thing. I need the bigger hit. And it never comes. And I'll tell you what I watched the other day, which was very sobering. And there's loads of them. Um, have you seen the Avicii documentary? I, re- I recommend it to you, didn't I? I've got it in my calendar to watch it at some point. Honestly, watch it. Because what... Ha- so Avicii, Amy Winehouse, uh, Alexandra McQueen, they all had this talent, this passion, this ability, which is me as an entrepreneur you as you with your fitness and they had this and they loved it so much they wanted to do more of it and they started to get this experience of success but then all of a sudden the excitement comes out of it and they end up on the success train the bullet train to where you know it, the whole thing goes completely out of control and it's and it doesn't become enjoyable and, and in the worst case scenario both all three of those ended up killing themselves like they get they chase this elusive there and i know people in my industry who i'm watching and year on year, they're getting bigger and they're getting badder. And I can see they're exhausted by chasing this next big thing. And it's like, I think we've got to be very careful as high performers to invest our energies in, in things that are, are tangible and thankful and genuinely give us returns. Because the addiction of high performance, I think, I think you can get carried away with it. And I think, I, I think I've been guilty of that in the past. Addicted to the grind. Yeah. 
What do you do like, balance yourself? What's your yang? Well, I used to drink quite a lot before I before I started my RNT stuff. I like my my I come from a family of like everyone drinks, like big drinkers, not alcoholics, but. You go, you go around there for a weekend and it's like the drinks will come out just after lunch, socially drinking in the afternoon in the garden. And you've got a barbecue, walk off to the pub. All my, all my family have always been drink, big drinkers and all my friends have been big drinkers. And then what I realised through this was like, that was definitely escapism for me. I would hit it hard during the week and then I wouldn't drink. You know, I'd go to the gym, I'd, I'd run half marathons, I'd hit it hard all week. And then Friday night it would be like, few gin and tonics, relax, listen to some music, go to a bar. And it was just huge escapism. That was probably my, my sort of balance previously. Now it's, well, now it's, I need to find it now because I haven't been balanced. I've been burning the candle at both ends for the last three months. Do you think it's possible for yourself? To find balance? Yeah. Well, this is the questions I'm asking at the minute. Like a lot of, I went to like a guided meditation the other night. That was quite nice. I always go to spa days, went to spa last week. I enjoy those sort of things, but my brain's not rested. Like it's, it's always restless. Like I've got an insatiable appetite. Like even while we're sitting here, you probably know, so I had to put a bit of chewing gum in. So I'm like, I need a bit of oral stimulation and then a soda water, chewing gum, some lunch, like do, do some work, get my journal out. My brain is very, very active. And, and as, as I become more developed as an individual, I need, higher levels of challenge and stimulation and that's where things like you know the car or you know buying companies and doing scaling the training company and doing bigger deals i need constant like stimulation so i don't know i don't know if balance but then equally my, my perfect balance i get to is i finish work on a friday and i don't do anything till a monday and that balance works quite well and then weekends i go away and get airbnbs and stuff for the last six to 12 months, I've not done that. Last six, yeah, last, since last summer, I've not really done that. And I've overcooked it to burnout. Yeah. You feel happiest when you're in that uh, struggle, essentially. I do, but I think, I think high performance is very similar to drinking alcohol. I think it's like, if you have the right amount of alcohol, it relaxes you, makes you feel more personable. Like it can put you in a really sociable environment. It can make, it can add some value. If you drink too much of it, it makes you act like an idiot. It makes you feel like crap. It has a really negative impact on your life and your relationships. And I think high performance is the same. But if you overcook it, it has it, it can it has really negative impact. And I don't enjoy that. You know, I don't I, I don't enjoy it when it's too much, for, too much for a sustained period of time. But if you look at, if you look at the curve of high performance, it's reasonably linear but it's reasonably linear up to the point of high performance, but then it's burnout off the end of a cliff. Like you are on a knife edge. Like one of the things on property entrepreneur, when people start their first year, the whole thing is how do we get them to do the work they don't want to do? We get, how do we get them to be productive? How do we get them to do their tasks? And that's where we all start as property entrepreneurs. Like how do you wrestle the, the procrastination monster? Like when you're training, how do you get people to go step? So how do you get people to do gym? When you get more into it, and now you get people on the board. We never have to talk about being productive on the board, which is our like advanced program for people who've been doing it for years. The biggest thing there is how do we stop ourselves from overcooking it? How do we stop ourselves from burning out? How do we be kinder to ourselves? And I expect the same is true with bodybuilders. Is like you know they be, they become obsessive, they get eating disorders, they like end up with mental issues, their relationships collapse, and high performers in business. It is like. It's climate. It's, it's yeah. It's it's riding that roller coaster, but not, you know, not letting yourself fall off the top, like not burning out. It's not easy. You just define what high. What you mean by high performers? Just so people are listening. Here. High performers. So high performance, at least by my definition, is so a high performer is the sort of person you know that does what they say they're going to do. They push themselves. They have a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset when they set a challenge that you know, they're going to achieve it. You know, they know they're going to achieve it. It's not a case of, are they going to do it or not? It's good. It's a case of what's going to happen through, through the process. And they have all the, all, they've developed all the right character traits, personality traits, hacks, skills, abilities to be, to be those sort of people. And they don't come easy, you know, but that's, you know, that's high performance, a high performer is also very self-aware. So 
we jokingly, obviously, on property entrepreneur, the board, you, you've trained or R and T have trained most of our board members with uh, body transformation, health and fitness, nutrition, and things like that. And uh, on on we're, we're we're live on that group all day, every day. And on like a Sunday morning or whenever it is, I, through the fourteen weeks, I had four fuck ups, if you like, where I, I, I fell off track. And I and I sat there in the morning. I was like, right, I woke up, I fucked up. I need to tell Akash that I fucked up. So like we're, there's messages going or whatever and, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying, yeah, I'm just sitting here writing my message to Akash to tell him that I messed up last night. And like some of the feedback was like, why are you telling him? Like I, I just wouldn't bother. And I was like, well, I don't understand that logic. Cause it's like, I want to be the best I can be. I want to hit this target. I've made a mistake. I now need to be told what my penalty is because I need to get back on track of hitting, you know, a 10.0. I need to hit this bang on. So when I said to you, I went to the cinema and I got a small bag of pick mix, which would have kept me within my macros. And the person I went with bought a huge bag of pick mix. And I, like pick mix is like my nemesis. I ate my bag before the advert started. And then by, by halfway through the film, I was started grazing through theirs. I ate their whole bag of pick mix. And then when we came out, so I was like, oh my God, I loved it. I said to you, I loved it. I was like, I need to pay for this now. I need to pay the price for this. So I went to the counter, got the receipt and found out how much it was. It was like £12.35. Went to the pick and mix counter and looked at it. It was 160 grams for £3.50 or whatever. And before I left the cinema, I like, worked out exactly how many grams of pick and mix that was. Went online and figured out what the average macros were for pick and mix, like the sugars, the carbs, all of that. And then sent to you what that worked out at. And it was about, I went about 1,250 calories over or whatever in that bag of pick and mix. And then you said to me, right, well, if, if we want to get back to where we were over the next four days before the next check-in, you need to claw that back. So, you know, I went, I was doing 2,900 calorie burn a day and in a deficit of between 850 well, and taking on between 850 and 900 calories, you know, 2000 calorie deficit. And that was horrendous. Like really, really bad. Like really, really horrendous. But it got me back to the day dot and I learned my lesson and I didn't do it again. So when you cheat, you be honest. You know, it's like if you cheat, you're only cheating yourself. And like I would encourage anyone to to be honest. Like that's the biggest thing. Like just be honest. Because you, you want to achieve it for yourself, not yeah, it's not a blag. And what? the workouts, yeah, go on. Oh, well, I was gonna say, why is uh, having coaching and mentorship so important in anything you do? Well, uh, accountability a bit, like accountability for most people probably. For me, it's not so much accountability because I've, I've cracked the, the discipline side of it to quite a level. So I don't need the, the accountability as much. For me, it was more the instruction and the blueprint. Like success and failure are very predictable. There's a blueprint to everything. If you want to become a piano player, you want to become a bodybuilder, you want to become an entrepreneur, someone somewhere has the exact blueprint you need and then the challenge isn't understanding the blueprint. You need the, that is the blueprint. That is the algorithm. That is the equation. You now need to develop the skill sets, the habits, the abilities to execute. Like execution is everything. And that's what I got from you is like, here is the blueprint. And then every week it is more coaching for me. It's like, right, this week we do this. We adjust that. And it's, it's, it is coaching. It's like, yeah, it's coaching you through the process. Right. This is what we do now. This is how we do it. And yeah, it, it, it was that. It's the education and the blueprint of this is what you need to do now. And I'll tell you another thing about R&T is that one of the strangest things about it is a high percentage of it doesn't make any sense. Like a lot of the process, well, I trust you and I trust the fact that you've got case studies and I trust the fact, you know, I just trust the process. But like when you start the diet, and the first four weeks of the diet is you need to eat more than you've ever eaten before. Mm -hmm. so, well, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't understand. I've been building up to start this for four weeks thinking, right, I need to, I need to cut down my eating. I need to shrink my stomach. I need to reduce my calories. And all of a sudden I'm eating three ginormous meals and I feel stuffed all day. And the idea of eating feels weird. That doesn't make any sense. And when you get ready for a photo shoot and you cut into a level where I, I, I couldn't lift weights. Like I, I was, I think I said to you, I'm going to have a heart attack or I'm going to, something else is going to happen. Like when I'm trying to get these weights up, I said, I think I said to you like multiple times, 
it is not physically possible to lift those weights any harder than I've lifted those today. And my weights are still coming down that I'm getting ready for a bodybuilding show and I can't lift the weights. I don't understand that. I'm going to get better results from dropping my weights. I don't understand that. I'm so skinny. I'm cutting holes in my belt every week, new holes in my belt every week to try and get my clothes to fit because I'm going flat and I'm going skinny and I look terrible and I'm getting ready for a photo shoot. I don't understand that. So much of it just does, doesn't make sense. But then, you know, trust the process. In the last week when we did that refeed and I went to get my pumps, it was like putting the air back in the balloon. I went but looking like, have you seen 50 Cent when he cut down for that movie? Yeah, yeah. And he went and he ended up looking like Faithless. I looked like that at the middle of July and then seven days later, just getting ready for the shoot or two days before the shoot. So it was towards the end of July, within the week of refeeding and getting ready for the shoot, I went from being a skinny weed that I was embarrassed to look at in the mirror because I looked horrendous to being pumped, muscular. These things appeared out of nowhere. And like my friends and family were like, Jesus Christ, like I have no idea where that came from. Like Akash is a genius because they've seen me wasting away, looking like almost dead with gorn. And then within a seven day, the whole, you put air back in the balloon exactly as you intended the whole time. You said you'd hit the target. I didn't think you'd hit the target. The back, the back fat came off, you know, you reinflated the balloon and it, and it ended up exactly as I'd hoped, like genuinely as I hoped. I had high expectations, but none of it made any sense. Yeah, I think about three weeks out, I think I sent you a, a message that I missed with, the, with the, dark, the dark sign. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And steps, it's like, I've been doing high intensity training for the best part of 10 years, sprint up a hill, do CrossFit, you know, try, a good workout is one when you leave feeling like you're going to collapse. And you said to me, like CrossFit, and there's nothing against CrossFit because I love CrossFit, like CrossFit's designed to make you tired, not, not lose fat. And I was like, that is definitely my experience. And then I lost all my weight doing steps. I was like, well, how, how have I lost two stone in weight and got to my lowest body fat for walking around town. <laughs> it's like, I would never have expected that. People are like, oh, I bet you nearly killed yourself in training. I was like, no, I, I walked a yeah, lot. Yeah. I remember we had a conversation back in March. I think you were saying, are oh, you doing so much high intensity exercise? You're feeling stressed out and it just making you really hungry. So you just ended up eating loads and, and just feeling all over the place. It was only when we took that out. It's got all the hit. You're doing like three, four sessions of hit and CrossFit. We took it all out and you just felt suddenly so much better. This is before we started uh, dieting hard. This was very much sort of the habit phase. Well, this is the whole thing about success and failure is very predictable. You don't know what you don't know. And the worst thing is working hard at the wrong things. And we all do it. Now, I see entrepreneurs all the time and they're, they're, trying to, they're doing 18 hour shifts because, don't get me wrong, I, I, I did 18 hour shifts like back in the day. But they're working hard doing the wrong things. I remember going to a, a, the Belfry and, I was, and I, was, I was ruined. I was like stressed, I was exhausted. And in the same day, you, Josh, and Adam said to me, you need to stop doing CrossFit. It's high stress. And that's when you told me about the stress cup again. And I was like, well, I didn't appreciate that. I always thought that the, that punishment was, I thought you were going to applaud me for doing, you know, the two, two workouts of the day in the same day or whatever. But you were like, well, no, you, you're killing yourself doing the wrong things. Go out and do 20,000 steps and just drop your calves. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. But it works. Yeah, brilliant. Any uh, any parting words before we go into the rapid fire se segment? Any parting words, words before the rapid fire segment? I think my expectation was that it was going to be very challenging, and it definitely was. Although I thought it would be challenging on the diet and training side, but I, I found those reasonably straightforward. And I found the biggest challenge was the mental side. I was not expecting that. I like, really not expecting that. And it was a huge mind game. And um, for anyone who's thinking of doing it, I would say like, make sure you make sure you understand the iceberg and uh, like, make sure you choose the target and you really size up what you're getting yourself in for before you go into it. And I would recommend a run up, like genuinely recommend a run up to have it stack because it makes it so much easier. When you understand all the education and how it works and then you go into the challenge, it's a lot easier than trying to, master the challenge and master the education as well at the same time 
loads of little hacks like green tea, soda water. Oh my God, I've never drunk so much soda water. One of the biggest things was think, I could tell you what every single service station on the M1 looks like and the amount of water I've drunk. You have to be very strategic about when you get in a car when you can't. Because um, I drink like literally like, all day, every day. Chewing gum, jalapenos, Frank's hot sauce, Tabasco sauce, bulking meals out with bags of rocket, um, oh, a protein and almond milk shakes. When you want to get your proteins up, like at the end of the day, protein, 250 milliliters of almond milk, which has got next to nothing in it, a bit, bit of ice. And I use colon care just to keep yourself running and it thickens it up really nicely. Blend that up and you end up with like a pint and a half of thick chocolate milkshake. And it's just the best treat after a workout or before bed, that sort of thing. Coke Zero, oh my God, that saved me. Cans of Coke Zero, all the little hacks and tricks. And uh, yeah, if Akash says your head's going to fall off, if you do this, your head is actually going to fall off and that makes you want to do it more, then you're the sort of person who should take on a challenge like that. Brilliant. Uh, let's finish up on a couple of rapid fire questions. Uh, if you had to give one book to uh, everyone you know, what would it be? Um, for personal development, how to win friends and influence people. Like without a doubt, that is a fundamental. Um, for uh, entrepreneurs who want to understand what the entrepreneur's journey is really like, Shoe Dog by Stephen Knight, the guy who founded Nike, is the best. You talk about the RNT's journey, we talk about the property entrepreneur's journey. It is the best book to understand what life is like as an entrepreneur, about enjoying the journey, not the destination. Every chapter is a, is a, is a huge failure and catastrophic disaster and it's just the most amazing book brilliant what's uh what's next on your challenge slash bucket list outside of business well unless i change tact so at the minute it's a commercial one and we're, we're, we're hitting a, a big financial target this quarter could we do it in quarters like quarter one was to break the world record for get up and get back we did that quarter two was my cut quarter three is hitting this financial target for property entrepreneur and quarter four is writing a book oh really you got the same quarter four target as me. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one I want to do. Well, there we go. It'll be a good pleasure to share the journey. Yeah. I think I might do that on my travels. Well, I'm going to start mine in October and then and try and get out somewhere for, for a bit of it as well, just to get into it. Excellent. Well, we can share the journey. I've, I've written a book, I've written, half written a book twice. And I've had coaching on it. I've had mentoring on it. I've got all the blueprints and structures for it. But I've never quite been happy with it and I've never committed to do it. But I now know exactly what it's going to look like. So I'm looking forward to writing it. it I'm assuming it's on, on uh, property entrepreneurship? Or? Yeah, so it is the property entrepreneur's journey. So it'll be called... Pretty much it'll be called, uh, yeah. It'll be called either It's All a Game or it'll be called Success and Failure, Very Predictable. And it's the whole blueprint, start to finish. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, it'll be really good to see your um, what you've got, so the plans in terms of the, the, the structures and the, and the blueprint for writing a book. So I, I've got no idea. We'll compare notes on it. I've got a book writer working with me as well, so uh, I'll, I'll gladly introduce you to them. Oh, brilliant. Awesome. Uh, who should we have on the podcast next? Les Elms. He's one of the property entrepreneur board members who's with you at the minute. If there was one person who was unlikely to, or one person who, who has the biggest challenge getting on this RNT body transformation, it's him. And he's played with it for ages. I've known Les for years, and he's done that run-up period now. And he is the most impressive example at the moment of someone who's pulled the pin. Like his whole life is changing because he's pulled the pin. If you want to, if you if you if you want to hear from somebody who will inspire people who are at the beginning of their journey, and there's probably more people listening to this at the beginning of their journey than at the end of it. He would be, I think, he would be a really, really valuable person for you to interview at this stage in his journey because he's smashing it. Oh, great! I'll get in touch with him then. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. As, where can people find you? Uh, follow me on Facebook, Daniel Hill. Um, follow me on Instagram, Property Entrepreneur. And check out PPN UK, it's our property group. And the Property Entrepreneur, www.property-entrepreneur.co.uk. That's our business and property training company. Great. We'll share those in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode with Dan, please share it with your family and friends. For more information, please visit www.rntfitness.com. Dot com and you can follow us on Instagram at rnt underscore fitness. Thanks for listening. 
Thank you so much for being here today on this episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I'd love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Please head over to iTunes and give us a five star rating, leave a comment, and share it with your family and friends. If you're interested in learning more about how to transform your body and positively change your life, go to www.rntfitness.com and explore all our free content on offer. Thank you.